We're going to kick off our conversation with Sum Safe, the CEO of Purpose Investments, which launched the world's first Bitcoin ETF in late February. And just yesterday was one of uh, three firms launching the first Ether ETFs. Now, Sum uh, is a well-known in the business community, founder and CEO of Purpose Investments, executive chairman and co-CIO of Ether Capital. We'll be talking to the CEO of Ether Capital, Brian Mossoff, later. Uh, he sold uh, his prior firm, Claymore Investments, to BlackRock in 2012. Sum is a serial entrepreneur. He liked that so much, he did it again. And he founded uh, Purpose Financial and Purpose Investments. He's also a former investment banker at RBC Capital Markets. Let's talk to him now. How are you, Sam? Thanks for joining us. Let me get, there we go. I'm on mute. <laughs> good to see you, Mark. Oh, good to see you. So let, let's start. Talking let's talk to you on mute, 2020. <laughs> I thought you were such a pro at this stuff. Anyway, that's fine. All right, we're good. We're good to go. You think <laughs> after a year. Yeah. This, right? <laughs> we're good to go now. So uh, the most uh, topical thing, obviously, is the the Ether ETF that you launched uh, yesterday. You've got a couple of rivals there as well. You uh, all launched on the same day. Uh, and uh, I understand that your uh, competitors, they're choosing to waive their management expense ratio for a while. Uh, you're not doing that for a reason. So explain that strategy. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think the the, the, un, the mo most important component of what happened yesterday was that uh, we, along with others, brought a really important innovation, and that is uh, secure, efficient, uh, low-cost way to basically own Ether, uh, which is the native token on the Ethereum ecosystem. and. You know, th that it should, nothing should get lost on all the noise and everything like that, but multiple products. But ultimately, that's the thing that investors and, you know, alike globally basically win with. Um, you know, in terms of kind of product differentiation and all the rest, I think, you know, what's really important to us is that, you know, we win because we have built a really powerful um, position as the best execution player. We've proven that in our Bitcoin product, which we launched uh, several months ago. Uh, now represents over a billion, almost a billion and a half in assets. But what we've done really, really well is show that, you know, providing access, secure access, and but most importantly, efficient access from an execution that, you know, the portfolio in the underlying ETF was efficient, executed extremely well, we're able to absorb a significant amount of capital to be able to do that. That stuff is very important. You know, we have a 1% a management fee, and you used a really important point, um, MER. Uh, so management expense ratio is the total cost of you know the the fund itself, and what we have is we have a very low cost uh, a total MER, and and so you know regardless of the the management fee, our MER is capped at one point five, and we actually think it's going to be well below that because of one of the things we negotiated was the economies of scale that we get from Ethereum and Bitcoin together. So so that's been a powerful thing, but I think that look. The market sometimes sees through short-term games that people play about waiving short-term fees. I mean, my view is, is that you know people care about the long-term in this asset, and there is a value to the asset, and they're not worried about whether they're paying 50 beeps or 1%. It's just better than paying you know 3% per transaction on Coinbase or you know a uh, you know whatever exchange that they're having to do this with, and then having to ultimately secure this in a um, uh, you know their own wallets or right. in an unregulated exchange. I think that to me is the thing that really people care about here. And institutions, broad advisors, um, and of course, uh, wealthier individuals who have you know never really been able to access this now get access to ether and of course subsequently um, uh, Bitcoin. So um, it's it, you, I think you raise a really great point. I mean, you know, you've got the largest AUM in the industry now. Uh, investors up until a reasonably short period of time have only been able to invest in, in common stocks of uh, companies that are involved in the Bitcoin uh, process. Uh, what impact do you think that as these e ETFs grow, they're going to be growing in the States, obviously, too. What impact do you think that has on the capital markets and the access that um, these other companies that are involved in the supply chain of Bitcoin, what impacts are going to have on investors' behaviors in terms of what they buy? Are they going to go buy ETFs directly or will they still be able to play the game uh, by investing in common stocks of uh, Bitcoin mining companies and those kind of uh, players? Well, I think I think John's a great question, and, and you know th this will play out. I think there's there's different reasons to buy different components of the stack. I mean, it's in my opinion very similar to something that all of us are very familiar with, uh, which is gold, right? And and commodity based investing, right? You know, when we buy gold, you know, we have a choice. We can go buy gold physically now, and and 
one of the really important moments that enabled that uh, was the 2004 listing of the GLD uh, ETF gold, right? And first real global um, uh, backed, uh, you know, kind of uh, sort of gold backed uh, physical uh, gold ETF in the world. And, and that in 2004 opened up access for all types of investors who prior to that, you know, the clunkiness of being able to go and buy gold was you have to go to this, you know, the retail bank branch, open up a safety deposit box or buy it from, from them at sometimes a 12 point spread. You know, now with an ETF, you were able to get it for, in their case, I think it was like 50 beeps or whatever it be. And that was a very powerful kind of, you know, offering. But at the same time, you have gold companies and, and miners and operators and royalty businesses that all spawn over time. And, you know, today investors choose when I want to get exposure to the gold commodity, do I want to own the operating businesses and the risks of, you know, the, the leverage or the margins or the, you know, the strategy that the execution is being done with, whether some companies hedge or not, or do I just want to hold gold directly? What's my play? And I think that's the thing that you'll see in, in this space as well, which is, you know, something like Bitcoin. You can now go get direct access to Bitcoin. You can have that trade, or you also could go and still buy a miner. You can, you know, you know, I think that this will actually open up more and more operating opportunities in time because more of the capital markets will see the use and the opportunity to allocate to this uh, as an asset category. Now, Sam, you've said before that the whole question about the possibility of Bitcoin as an actual currency is kind of irrelevant. And what in, what intrigues you more is uh, the platforms, the blockchain, the store of value, the potential for cryptocurrency to maybe be uncorrelated to other types of assets. So so why, why do you kind of not, not to dismiss it, but, but why do you say uh, the, the currency question is irrelevant right now? Well, I think the big question is, um, so look, Bitcoin, you talked about it at the outset, Bitcoin was established as the first way to be, be able to enable someone to transfer value digitally. You know, as I, I, you know, the internet was built around transferring information digitally, and that was its profound uh, element. But what Bitcoin and, and was originally designed around was the ability to basically transfer value. That was its profound element, and of course, then how to secure the network to be able to do so. A lot of people have been talking about digital currencies well before Bitcoin was established in, in the late 2000s. But the big thing that really matters is, you know, that the Bitcoin has this really important intellectual property around, um, you know, design of kind of security and structure. The platform has been secured, and then that in itself proves to you that it's never going away. It's undestroyable, similar to gold. I mean, that's why it gets bucketed in the digital gold concept, which is it's, it's the native way to basically you know, transfer value like gold, but in an undestroyable way. The thing that really is interesting is that Bitcoin has a limited supply, as you know, it's 21 million. And so for that reason, it will always have this question mark of you know, supply and demand. And if demand starts to become very powerful, well, then all of a sudden supply is limited and that way the price could keep going up. So the issue with it as a currency is that who wants to transact in something that ultimately could continue to go up in value over time? That's the real problem that Bitcoin faces today is that, yes, it could be a really nice peer to peer network thing. But if the token ultimately keeps going up, I don't want to transfer it. And so that's a real issue. And I think that that's why Bitcoin has kind of gravitated over the last decade from this peer to peer blockchain uh, uh, kind of linear model to now a store of value is because people are saying, wait a minute, as more and more investors want access to this asset, the value of the token will just keep going up and up because you know it is absolutely never going to be destroyed and you know it's never going to have more than 21 million Bitcoins. That's why I think, by the way, I get so excited about something like Ethereum because that's a very different goal on that platform. It is actually building the network and the infrastructure utility to enable tokenization of many different applications like payments, like um, uh, you know, transfers of different forms of value and much more intricate ways to transfer value, um, such, such as we're seeing more and more today with NFTs and things like that. I couldn't agree more, Sam. I think Ethereum is absolutely the most exciting opportunity in this whole crypto world, 100%. But I just to ask another question about portfolio diversification because, you know, Purpose was all about delivering low-cost investment alternatives to mutual funds and those kinds of things, and a diversified portfolio. In this case, with both Bitcoin and Ethereum, and uh, I, I think the Ethereum breakthrough is a huge accomplishment. Congratulations. What do you think uh, an investor, uh, because 
should should allocate to these kind of uh, currencies or these these tokens, so to speak, because in the case of most ETFs, you get diversification, and that diversification is supposed to provide you with some safety from volatility, yeah. whereas these currencies or tokens right now are very, very volatile. So what would you advise an individual investor? How much money would SOMSEF put into Ethereum or Bitcoin ETFs? Well, yeah, I'll answer it in two ways. One is how much what I put in is, I've actually got a significant amount in, in Ether, and I'm a big believer in that, and I also have some exposure to Bitcoin, but my dominance in my exposure is in Ether. And it's because they actually have two very different goals. And I kind of articulated earlier, but like, unfortunately, everything gets coupled together. And it's because it's still an early stage and people are learning it that they talk about crypto and, and Bitcoin and Ether, basically the same thing. And they're actually very different. So as I said, Bitcoin, in my opinion, plays a really important role as a very unique supply and demand sentiment asset that you know could be a very interesting kind of reason for many things, sort of value, inflation hedge, but also just you know long term, a lot more people are going to want to buy it, and demand is uh, you know going to grow, and and, and then all, as, a, as as supply is limited, that that that's a nice dynamic, and, and long term that's a, a nice appreciation. So my view is on something like that is you're probably putting half a percent, maximum one percent of a normal person's portfolio. Now there are younger people today that have a significantly greater leverage in their portfolios to you know crypto, and and for them maybe that's the right thing to do because maybe they're thinking long term and this is a very unique asset, and um, you know they can take greater, greater risks. But my view is as an individual you should not have a significant amount of your wealth in this, especially at the early stages. As it forms, you can you know apply more allocation. Ethereum on the other hand, or Ether, is like a technology company. I would look at it the same way I would apply to a venture bet or still it's early, but like what's the next Amazon? What would I put into and allocate to the next Amazon if I didn't yet know if it was gonna become the next Amazon? That's the way I think about it. So does it allocate half a percent, one percent, two percent? Just like I would to a single stock, that's probably the way I'd look at Ether. And then as it grows and it proves itself, you may wanna allocate more and more over time. But that's the way, these are very different components of a portfolio, although bucketed together in this kind of crypto digital asset space. Right. Great stuff. Thanks for your time today, Sam. Great to be here, guys. Thanks, Sam. All right, Sam Safe, the CEO of Purpose Investments. So uh, you don't own, John, any Bitcoin, any Ether, any cryptocurrency yourself or for your clients. But if I put the proverbial gun to your head, what would you buy and how would you buy it? Uh, well, <clears throat> having done a lot of reading about the, the structural aspects of both uh, currencies, and I think Sam nailed it in his conversation. I think either is a very, very ex uh, exciting uh, token uh, system and a decentralized system. And I think if you wanted to own one of those two currencies, one of those two tokens, so to speak, I would definitely be an owner of, of the Ether ETF. And I think, you know, Purpose has, I believe, the lowest MER ratio of all the offerings out there right now. So I would definitely, if you wanted to have exposure specifically to it, but I also think that investors are going to be able to benefit from this uh, tremendously through the financial system. Uh, the financial system is going to be a major, major beneficiary of being able to uh, use blockchain technology to dramatically reduce its costs and its structural costs. Uh, it's going to be a major asset for the real estate business where we'll, we'll theoretically be able to transfer ownership uh, through uh, of your house uh, directly to another purchaser and cut a lot of middlemen, which I think is a tremendous opportunity, obviously. So I think you don't necessarily need to buy direct exposure to these technologies to be a winner. Um, you know, Amazon delivered a lot of value to other people. Amazon was a huge winner but it also delivered huge value to small businesses in terms of being able to access consumers. So you don't need to just buy the actual um, companies in the crypto space to be a beneficiary of it. And Gardner says that blockchain could be about a $3 trillion business by uh, 2030.